Yeah, I, I know. I'm aware that it's been more than a month. We'll start with the Confederation of Chaos. Conma Bowl. Before the November window, Argentina had a perfect record and were top of the table. To start though, we'll talk about Bolivia, who at this point were bottom of the table. After another winless month, the Bolivian FA kicked head coach Gustavo Costas to the curb. Replacing him was Antonio Carlos Zago, and he could not have started his tenure better. Zago led Bolivia to a 2-0 win at home against Peru. Over in Venezuela, La Bina Tinto and Ecuador could only play out a goalless draw. Brazil, hoping to get back up from their stumbles last month, used some Vinny sauce and finished it with a Martinelli guard early against Colombia. But don't worry folks, the funny isn't over just yet. Colombia went out to equalize through Luis Diaz in the 75th minute, and then four minutes later Diaz gave Colombia their first ever win versus Brazil in a World Cup qualifier. Argentina vs Uruguay happened soon after, and the whole of South America got to witness vintage Bielsa stun the world champions 2-0. And don't you worry, that red card streak is still ongoing. Over in Santiago, two players got red cards in a 0-0 draw between Chile and Paraguay. In the next match day, Colombia grabbed 6-6 six six points for the month, a massive window for them. Ecuador earned themselves a 1-0 win as well thanks to longtime veteran Angel Mena. Uruguay continued their fantastic form with a 3-0 victory against the sea level merchants. It should be mentioned by the way, Darwizzi is currently the top scorer in South American qualifiers. Talking about another clinical striker, this was Bolivia's Marcelo Moreno's last game as he announced his retirement from the national team. Brazil vs Argentina, like always, was highly anticipated months in advance. This matchup in particular was extra special as both teams wanted to make a statement. Could the reigning champions display their superiority against their biggest rivals? Or could the Brazilians spoil the party and keep people from remembering that despite not winning a World Cup in 20 plus years, Brazil is constantly constantly one of the favorites. We did not have to wait long for the action to start. In fact, it started before the whistle even blew, because over in the stands, there were brawls happening between Argentinian and Brazilian fans. As a result, the game was postponed, and players on both teams watched in horror, scared for families and children who could have been caught in the crossfire. Oh, also, once more, police showing their galaxy brain IQ out here. Yeah guys, let's beat the people fighting each other. That totally will calm the situation down. Moron. The game finally took place, however, after 30 minutes, and Argentina would go on to win with an Otamendi header. Oh, also, we can thank Joe Linton for extending the red card streak. But this was not only Argentina's first ever World Cup qualifier victory on Brazilian soil. In fact, this was the first time ever Brazil had lost a qualifier at home. And forget that World Cup drought conversation, because Brazil are currently on a four-game winless streak in qualifiers and haven't won since September. That last win was against Peru, and speaking of them, after five straight scoreless games, the Peruvians finally scored a goal. However, into the second half, the Peruvians invited Venezuela back into the game, they found the equalizer, and the misery continues for Peru. But don't lose hope just yet, Peruvians, because after yet another awful month, Juan Reynoso has finally resigned. Rejoice, Peruvians. I don't know who's coming up next, but surely they can score more than one goal in six games. Now looking at the table, Argentina are still in the lead, but Uruguay with their two wins this month have closed the gap to just two points. Colombia also had a perfect window, and this sees them jump into third. Venezuela, despite earning just two points, still maintain fourth, while Ecuador continue to slowly make their way up the table. Four points in November sees them go up one position. Brazil continue to fall like a rock. They went from third at the beginning of November to sixth, and their defense has been truly abysmal so far. Only Peru and Bolivia have conceded more goals than the Brazilians. It will never happen. Not today, not tomorrow, not ever. And just hanging in the playoff spot is Paraguay, who earned just one point this window. Also, for once, we can say something slightly positive about Bolivia because they are no longer at the bottom of the table. Into Asia, and the second round of qualifiers is ready to commence. The second round format is pretty simple. Firstly, those who advance from the first round will now join everyone else in the second round. But talking about this round, there are nine groups with four teams each. Teams will play their group opponents both at home and away. And after the end of this round, the top two will advance to the third round. In Group A, we have Qatar, India, Kuwait, and Afghanistan. Imagine putting so much work into bribing FIFA and generating a record number of verbal gymnastics to poorly hide your awful working conditions and human rights abuses. And in the end, your nation crashes out of the groups with zero points. <laughs> Well, that's exactly what happened to Qatar, who made history becoming the only World Cup host 
to earn not even one point. Now when this team isn't beating up on weaker Asian opponents, they're losing to the likes of Haiti, Panama, even Kenya. Maxwell, don't you think you're being a little biased? Of course I am these frauds. India has managed to qualify for one World Cup, and that was back in 1950, but they withdrew from participating despite FIFA offering to pay for the team's travel expenses. Many speculated India's withdrawal was because of the fact they couldn't play barefoot, but that's a myth. It more so had to do with simply the fact that India valued the Olympics more than the World Cup. However, since that 1950 feat, India hasn't qualified for the World Cup since. But on a positive, nowadays you can't talk about Indian football without mentioning its star of hope, Sunil Chetri. The 39-year-old striker has scored 93 goals for his country, which puts him amongst the likes of Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo in all-time leading international scores. Kuwait has one World Cup appearance from back in 1982, and even though they finished bottom of their group, they managed a historic draw with Czechoslovakia. Something even more impressive was when they were ranked 24th in the world in 1998. Unfortunately, it's been a slippery slope towards rock bottom in the last decade and more, as Kuwait's national team has been plagued by suspensions and inactivity. Between 2007 and 2017, the federation has been suspended three times, and this inactivity saw the nation drop all the way down to 189th in the world. They even missed out on World Cup 2018 qualifiers due to inactivity. Times are changing though, the national team is actually active again, and they're starting to go through a bit of a rebuild. Not to mention, in their last qualification campaign, they managed to finish runners-up in their second round group that consisted of Australia and Jordan. Over in Group B, we have Japan, Syria, North Korea, and Myanmar. A bit politically charged, as you can see. Japan since the agony of Doha in 1993 has qualified for every World Cup, but since then they've suffered another type of agony in the tournament itself. In six World Cup appearances, Japan has fallen short of the quarterfinals on numerous occasions. 2018 was probably the most painful when they squandered a 2-0 lead against Belgium and lost 3-2. 2022 was quite heartbreaking as well when Japan practically invited Croatia back into the game and ended up losing on penalties after initially being 1-0 up at the half. But with every moment of suffering has been iconic instances of brilliance. 2022, for example, saw Japan's entertaining technical football take down European giants like Germany and Spain in the most dramatic ways possible. Victories like these have made Japan the model for development and success in Asia. And the national team is currently on a historic winning streak, and there seems to be no sign of stopping them. Syria's national team hasn't played in the nation's capital of Damascus since 2010 due to the ongoing war in the country, which makes their 2018 World Cup qualification campaign that much more inspirational. Syria finished third in their third round group, which consisted of giants like Iran, South Korea, China, and Qatar. They then had a two-legged playoff against Australia to determine who would move on to the intercontinental playoffs. In the first leg, Australia took an early lead. However, Syria star striker Omar al soma converted a penalty. al soma then scored six minutes into the second leg to give Syria the advantage on aggregate. Unfortunately, the Syrians couldn't hold on to their lead, and Australia would go on to win on aggregates in extra time. When you think of the North Korean national team, you think of two things. The 2014 World Cup, where they beat Japan 7-0 and then won the tournament by beating Brazil 2-1. And Han Kwang Song, the young North Korean striker whose promising career was derailed by sanctions against his home country. The man has been missing from football for at least three years now. North Korea has been to two World Cups, both famous for reasons opposite of one another. In one of the biggest upsets in World Cup history, North Korea defeated Italy in 1966 to advance to the quarterfinals. And then there was the 2010 World Cup, where after holding their own against Brazil in a two one loss, the country decided to broadcast the team's next game against Portugal, where they got ass blasted 7 0. Over in Group C, we have two East Asian nations in South Korea and China, and then two Southeast Asian nations in Thailand and Singapore. South Korea has historically been one of the best nations in Asia, and since 1986, they've qualified for every World Cup. Of course, their best performance came in 2002 when they co hosted the tournament alongside Japan. South Korea, in one of the greatest showings of sportsmanship, produced stunner after stunner in the knockouts to finish fourth place. Fun fact, by the way, Papa Park Hung So was the team's assistant coach at the time. The South Koreans haven't been able to replicate that same feat since, but have put together some decent World Cup runs. 2022 in particular was pretty special when the Taiguk Warriors scored a last minute winner against Portugal to advance to the round of 16. China have one World Cup appearance back in 2002 where they not only lost all their games, but also didn't score a single goal. That said, China were still a pretty solid team in Asia throughout the early 2000s. Fourth place in the 2000 Asian Cup, and then in 2004 they finished runners up. Unfortunately, a failed plan to become 
become one of the best Asian nations by 2030, and the best nation in the world by 2050, has tarnished the entirety of Chinese football history. What was the plan in question? Give players from Europe ungodly amounts of money to play in the Chinese Super League, also naturalize random Brazilians after one year. How that was legal, I have no idea. Oh, what's that? Youth development, you say? Don't be silly. To everyone's surprise, um, this whole plan blew up in China's face, and now they're actually in a worse spot than they were when they were declining in 2016. On a positive though, it seems like the national team is ditching its naturalized Brazilians for actual Chinese talent. Thailand are the kings of the Rice Balkans, or better known as Southeast Asia. The War Elephants have also made it to the final round of World Cup qualifiers twice. However, in those two appearances, they failed to grab a single win, which really goes to show how far Southeast Asian nations are from the elite Asian teams. Thailand has been making efforts to play better competition to gain experience, however. In October, they played Estonia and Georgia. Ties will want to forget what happened in Georgia, though. Group D consists of Oman, Kyrgyzstan, 007, and Taiwan. Oman has never qualified for the World Cup, but you can never take them lightly in the qualifiers. In their 2018 and 2022 campaigns, the Omanis were just within one point of the fourth round playoff. They also finished third in the Central Asian Football Association Nations Cup, which consists of challenging opponents like Iran and Uzbekistan. And right at the beginning of the year, Oman were heartbroken in extra time by Iraq in the Gulf Cup. With every shortcoming, however, the relatively young squad continues to grow even stronger. Originally part of the Soviet Union national team, Kyrgyzstan gained independence in 1991 and joined AFC three years later. Kyrgyzstan has never made it past the second round of qualifiers, but they are showing signs of improvement. The national team made its debut in the Asian Cup back in 2019 and reached the round of 16. The White Falcons have once again qualified for the tournament happening next year. The country's top domestic league is the Kyrgyz Premier League, whose logo looks like a rejected Watford badge. 007 Malaysia used to be a pretty solid team throughout the 1970s and 1980s. They never qualified for a World Cup, but they did make appearances in the Asian Cup. However, a bribery scandal wrecked the football scene, and Malaysia has not been the same since. 2010 gave the nation a glimpse of hope when a team of mostly U23 players won the AFF Championship. However, nothing ever came of it besides the Milo Merchants' worst ever loss in 2015 against the UAE, where they conceded 10 goals. But since the appointment of Kim Pan Gon, who looks like that one asshole from Squid Game, Malaysia are seeing a bit of a resurgence. Just last year, Malaysia qualified for the upcoming Asian Cup. It's the first time they've qualified on merits in 42 years. Group E is a very interesting one. We got Iran, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and Hong Kong. Iran has been consistently one of the best Asian nations in the last 50 plus years. They've qualified for six World Cups with their best stretch coming in the last decade with the Iranians qualifying for the last three. Ironically enough though, this last decade has probably been the most painful. Just because of how many times Iran has come up short of reaching the knockouts. Whether that be Messi going clutch, referees being awful in other games, or even pull a six nutsack. And time is running out on this golden generation. Most of Iran's players right now are closing in on age 30. This could open an opportunity for the next generation, however, especially after the U-17 team stunned Brazil in the most recent U-17 World Cup. Uzbekistan, like many underrated Asian nations, have come painstakingly close to World Cup qualification on a couple of occasions. 2014's campaign was probably the hardest pill to swallow for the Uzbeks when they lost on penalties to Jordan in the fourth round playoff. In my eyes, Uzbekistan is always a team you gotta look out for. They're just that permanent dark horse. A lot of that kind of has to do with the fact that they have that fusion of Europe and, and Asia in their players. You know, they're they're pretty big. The team just won't ever roll over and die for anyone, and this has been the case since their golden era in the 2000s. 2022 was a bit of a disappointment with Uzbekistan not making it to the final round of qualifiers for the first time since they joined AFC. However, their current manager has a 61% winning percentage since 2021, so expect the Uzbeks to bounce back this campaign. Turkmenistan, you probably affiliate this country with their former insane leader, whose name I will not bother pronouncing. But you probably don't know anything about their football and I wouldn't really blame you. The U23s did reach the quarterfinals in the U23 Asian Cup after advancing out of a group consisting of Uzbekistan, Iran, and Qatar, however, so maybe there's a bit of hope. Group F, we have Iraq, Vietnam, 
Philippines, and Indonesia. Iraq has one World Cup appearance under their belt, and that was back in 1996 where they lost every game but did score one goal. Since then, the national team has made numerous appearances in the final round, but that's as far as it goes. Iraq's best period came around the mid-2000s when the nation was ranked at an all-time high 39th in the world in 2004. They then went on one of the greatest Cinderella runs in the 2007 Asian Cup and won the whole thing. Fast forward to now, and we might be seeing the best Iraqi team since that triumph of 2007. Vietnam made history back in the 2022 campaign, becoming the first Southeast Asian nation to win in the final round of qualifiers. But that was back during their Park Hong So era. Things are a little bit in question as the Vietnamese get used to their new head coach Philippe Troussier. Recently, Vietnam has been partaking in some more challenging friendlies, and while they've lost every single one of them, including Korea where they lost 6-0, you know, it's good experience. The question now is though, can Troussier fill in the shoes of the great Papa Park? The Philippines, also known as Diaspora FC. For the longest time, basketball has not only been the preferred sport by fans, but even footballers. During the second half of the 20th century, the Filipino FA couldn't financially support their best players enough, which prompted numerous national team players to become basketball players. Then there was the rule mandated by Congress that only said 40% of the team could be Chinese Filipino or another foreign blood, and with the knowledge that sponsors and leagues were mostly funded by the Chinese Filipino community, you can kind of see how this probably didn't end well. The effects were detrimental to Filipino football, but in the last decade, there seems to be a bit of a renaissance happening. It all started with the Miracle of Hanoi, where the Philippines upset Vietnam in the 2010 AFF Championship. Nine years later, and the Philippines participated in their first ever Asian Cup. In Group G, we have Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Tajikistan, and Pakistan. Saudi Arabia has been to six World Cups, with their best performance being a round of six appearance in 1994. And in the most recent World Cup, the Saudis shocked eventual champions Argentina in their group opener. The team were gifted watches after the victory and then proceeded to disappear for the rest of the tournament. However, it doesn't look like Saudi Arabia are stopping anytime soon, as they actually just won the U23 Asian Cup last year, and they should be pretty strong contenders for the Asian Cup in January. The closest Jordan has ever come to qualifying for a World Cup was back in 2014. After beating Uzbekistan on penalties, they were absolutely battered by Uruguay in the intercontinental playoffs. That was also the only time Jordan has ever reached the final round of qualifiers. Nowadays, they're in a stagnation similar to that of the British economy. Currently, though, there's one Jordanian playing European football, and that's Moussa Altamari of Montpellier. He only just moved to the French club this year and already has three goals in nine appearances. Tajikistan, like its former USSR counterparts, didn't join AFC until the early 90s. They also have a badge that just goes unnecessarily hard. Anyways, the Sons of the Highlands have been making slow and steady progress. Last qualification campaign, the Tajiks put some decent performances and even earned themselves a spot into the Asian Cup next year. Group H has the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Yemen, and Nepal. The UAE has only ever made it to one World Cup. That was back in 1990, where they conceded 11 goals. But hey, they did have that one consolation goal against West Germany. In the 2000s, the UAE appointed high-profile managers like Carlos Quiroz, Roy Hodgson, and Dick Advocates. Ironically enough, though, this was one of the worst periods for the Emiratis. Into the mid-2010s, the national team had a bit of a resurgence. They finished third in the 2015 Asian Cup and then fourth in the following tournament. This was all followed up by the UAE's best chance at qualifying since 1990, where the team just missed out on the intercontinental playoffs after losing to Australia in the fourth round playoff. We've been over this many times, but I still just cannot stress how painful the 2000s were for Bahrain. In 2006 World Cup qualifiers, Bahrain overcame Uzbekistan to have a chance at qualifying for the big dance through the intercontinental playoffs. They were matched up against Trinidad and produced a one-all draw on the first leg. Unfortunately, in the return leg at home, the Bahrainis lost 1-0. Then in World Cup 2010 qualifiers, Bahrain overcame Saudi Arabia on away goals to once again advance to the intercontinental playoffs. But once more, Bahrain conceded at home in the second leg. To f New Zealand this time. Since then, the pain has been numbing for the number one bottlers of Asia, and the national team hasn't made it to the final round of qualifiers since 2010. Finally, there's Group I, where we have Australia, Palestine, Lebanon, and Bangladesh. Australia has made every single World Cup since 2006, and the nation has a tendency to surprise many when it's least expected. In 2006, they were the second lowest ranked nation, but that didn't stop the Socceroos from reaching the last 16. Then in 2022, Australia somehow prevailed over Peru in the the intercontinental playoffs. Then come the World Cup, everyone saw Australia as one of the worst teams going into the tournament. However, once more, everyone ate their words as Australia defeated both Tunisia 
and Denmark to reach the last 16 again. And they weren't too far off equalizing against Argentina in the last 16. There's no telling what Australia will be up to in this campaign, but watch out for Wonder Kids Gran Cool and Nestori Irankunda. While Irankunda hasn't made a senior appearance, his clean strikes gained the attention of Bayern, who signed the 17-year-old for over 3 million euros. For the last two months, I've watched my own country side with an Israeli government that aims to wipe out the entire Palestinian population. Once more, here's proof that the US has not learned from 2003 as Gaza, a region where more than half its population is children, continues to be wiped off the map by the bloodthirsty Israeli Defense Force. I see the Israeli government making claims about how Hamas terrorists are using civilians as shields, they're disguising themselves as civilians, all this kind of stuff, as if that justifies bombing hospitals and roadways for innocents to escape. But having just recently visited the War Remnants Museum in Vietnam, you will often see quotes from US soldiers justifying killing numerous civilians simply because they thought they were Viet Cong informants. They weren't confirmed, it was just a mere assumption that led to the massacre of millions of villagers. You see the parallel here? We need a ceasefire, and we must call upon our own leaders to make sure that happens by any means necessary. Not that that's actually going to happen, because I'm pretty sure the US vetoed a ceasefire just a few days ago. But just for the sake of, I guess, idealism, no more Israelis in Gaza need to die. No more Palestinians in Gaza need to die. And the poison of Zionism must be eradicated. It tries to disguise its evil as anti-Semitism and prevents any kind of progress for peace to be made. One more thing, by the way. Just because I want a ceasefire does not mean I'm a supporter of Hamas. You're a fucking moron if you think that. Let me make this very clear. I denounce both the IDF and Hamas. Both are bloodthirsty, and it doesn't matter how much more bloodthirsty the other one is, no civilian should be dying. Finally, I'll end it off on this. Free Palestine. The Palestinian national team has never made it to the final round of World Cup qualifiers. They are making progress, however, as the nation qualified for its first ever Asian Cup in 2015, and they haven't missed a tournament since. With the upcoming qualifiers, it'll be difficult for the national team to focus on the game with everything going on, but perhaps like Ukraine, it could light a fire within this team. And finally, we have Lebanon. Lebanon has never qualified for the World Cup, but they've made final round appearances in 2014 and 2022. They actually had a pretty decent start in their last campaign, but ended up fizzling out and finished bottom of their final round group. Considering though this is only a few decades after being ravaged by a civil war, it's admirable how much progress has been made, which also includes appearances in the 2019 Asian Cup and the upcoming one in January. In Group A, Qatar has gone off to a good start with two of two wins, one of which included an 8-1 destruction of Afghanistan. The landslide result was due to a boycott by 19 Afghani players citing corruption of the current federation president. Due to this, Afghanistan's squad was far weaker and it didn't help they had a new coach having to deal with with all this. Second place Kuwait and third place India are currently tied on points with Kuwait having the advantage and goal difference. The two actually played each other in this window where India grabbed a win away from home. Group B, as you'd expect, is currently being led by Japan who continue their unbeaten run. They beat both their opponents 5-0. Once again, second and third are currently tied on points. North Korea have the advantage and goal difference, but Syria managed to beat them in this window. Also, remember Han Kwang Song? Well, after three years, he's reappeared from the shadows and even scored a goal against Myanmar. South Korea have started perfect so far in Group C. They schooled Singapore and then took down China. Thailand and China are currently tied with the Thais having the advantage on goal difference. And just like the last two groups, these two actually went up against each other. China prevailed with a 2-1 win in Bangkok, and during the match as well, a young Chinese kid was spotted doing homework at halftime. Over in Group D has the biggest shock of them all, 007 Malaysia has started brilliantly. In their opener, Malaysia found themselves 3-1 down against Kyrgyzstan, but then came back to win 4-3. Malaysia then ended the window with another three points against Taiwan. This group is Oman's for the taking, but it hasn't really been that way so far. They started with a solid win versus Taiwan, but then lost to Kyrgyzstan. Group E is setting itself up to be a close battle between Iran and Uzbekistan. After both won their opening fixtures, they played each other four days later. Iran took an early 2-0 lead, but that was cancelled out by Uzbekistan's rally back in the second half. Iraq has a solid grasp over Group F. They began by defeating the nation with the most annoying fans on the planet, 5-1, and then a last-minute goal in Hanoi gave the Iraqis 6 to six points for November. Meanwhile, Vietnam are placed second after they scratched a win against the Philippines away from home. Saudi Arabia are clear of the pack in Group G. They beat Pakistan 4-0 and then Jordan 2-0 to earn six points. And after a draw with Jordan and a 6-1 win versus Pakistan, Tajikistan hold on to second. UAE have the lead in Group H and already Ali Mabkuts has three goals to his name in qualifiers. Meanwhile, Bahrain seeking their first round appearance since 2010 hold on to second after beating Yemen. And finally in Group I, it's all Australia. They open
opened their qualifiers with a 7-0 drubbing of Bangladesh and followed it up with a 1-0 win against Palestine. In second place currently is Lebanon, who have drawn twice to begin their campaign. On to African qualifiers. Yes, you can stop f***ing bugging me about it because it's actually arrived finally. Wait, didn't I say when African qualifiers were starting in the first qualifier review? And I still kept asking? Like, come on, man. Come on. Use your head. However, for the first time ever in African qualifiers, there's no playoff round prior to the group phase. The first round of qualifiers will consist of nine groups with six teams each, which means I have 54 more teams to preview. Kill me now. Just like Asia, the countries will play their group opponents both at home and away. And at the end of this round, each group winner will automatically qualify for the World Cup, while the four best second place finishers will advance to the playoff round. To start, we have Group A, which consists of Egypt, Egypt, Burkina Faso, Guinea-Bissau, Sierra Leone, Ethiopia, and Djibouti. Egypt has made it to two World Cups back in 1990 and 2018. 2018 was supposed to be the exciting tournament back for the Egyptians, but it derailed very quickly. To start, Mo Salah was injured right before the tournament in the Champions League final. And then to make things worse, there was a whole dispute between him and the Federation. And that was because Salah's likeness was being used on a plane with a rival telecommunications company. But the pain doesn't end there for our Egyptian King. Because during a penalty shootout to determine who would be going to World Cup 2022, Salah was blinded by a swarm of lasers and missed his attempt. Egypt would go on to lose the shootout and miss out on the World Cup. And that was a year after Mo Salah and Egypt lost on penalties in the AFCON final. So the question now is, will Mo Salah ever catch a break? Just once. Back during 2014 World Cup qualifiers, Burkina Faso made it to the final rounds and defeated Algeria 3-2 in the first leg at home. Unfortunately, a single Algerian goal in the second leg was enough to send Burkina Faso packing. Burkina Faso has always seemed to be just one step away from greatness, aka qualifying for a World Cup. In the last five AFCONs, the Stallions have finished in the top four in three. And the last World Cup qualification campaign, they were just two points below Algeria. It wasn't until the 2022 World Cup qualification campaign that Guinea-Bissau would actually advance out of the first round. This along with four straight AFCON qualifications gives fans some hope, albeit not much. Oh, also there's this one player named Pele. The joke was funny back in 2015, trust me. Sierra Leone, pretty sure Big Sean made a song that's named Sierra Leone. <clears throat> Anyways, back in the 2021 AFCON, Sierra Leone surprised everyone by holding reigning champions Algeria to a goalless draw. This was also Sierra Leone's first AFCON match in 25 years. Then the following match, Sierra Leone drew with Ivory Coast. Unfortunately, they failed to make it out of the group after losing to Equatorial Guinea. While Sierra Leone has had very little success in World Cup qualifiers, those results in the previous AFCON could give them some confidence coming into this World Cup qualification campaign. Oh, I did some digging by the way, and I came across two interesting Sierra Leonean clubs. Anti-Drug Strikers FC and Mighty Blackpool. Which Ethiopian club are you? Defense Force SC, Ethiopian Coffee FC, or Ethiopian Insurance FC? Let me know in the comments. Mussolini's owners have never qualified for the World Cup. The closest they came was during 2014 qualifiers when Ethiopia reached the third round playoffs, but then were walloped by Nigeria. Ethiopia was one of the best in Africa once upon a time. Between 1957 and 1968, the Ethiopians won one AFCON and finished in the podium twice. Nowadays though, Ethiopians are simply happy just to qualify for the tournament. Djibouti only started attempting World Cup qualification back in 2002. But despite the size of the country and its tendency to withdraw draw due to financial issues, the national team has managed to advance past the first round in 2010 and 2022 qualifiers. Group B, we have Senegal, DR Congo, Mauritania, Togo, Sudan, and uh, South Sudan. I'm sure that'll go well. Senegal has made it to three World Cups in the last 30 years. Their best finish came in 2002 when after stunning reigning champions French, the Senegalese made it all the way to the quarterfinals. Fast forward to now, for the last eight years under long-serving head coach Alio Cisse, the Senegalese have been enjoying a golden era, but with many core players getting older, the youngsters will need to step in. DR Congo made one appearance in the World Cup, and that was back in 1974 when they were called Zaire. They lost every single game, didn't score a goal, and conceded 14 times. Now Nowadays, the national team holds numerous talented players, some that play in the Turkish League, the Premier League, Bundesliga, and Ligue 1. Here's the issue though. The national team is hilariously unserious. In the playoffs of African qualifiers last year, the Congolese managed to draw with heavy favorites Morocco in the first leg. And before one of the biggest games in the country's history, players were seen eating massive amounts of food. 
They lost the second leg 4-1. Mauritania's national team played its first game in 1961, but they didn't win a game until 1980. So it probably shouldn't come to the shock of anyone that Mauritania has never qualified for a World Cup, or even has come close. In fact, in seven attempts, the national team has only ever won two times. But perhaps there is hope for Mauritania, because they qualified for their first AFCON in 2019, and they've qualified for every since. Back in the mid-2000s, Togo was experiencing a golden generation, and qualified for the 2006 World Cup. While the tournament was pretty underwhelming, this was just the beginning for Togo. However, the team failed to qualify for 2010, and that was followed by a team bus attack during the 2010 AFCON that killed multiple staff members and injured numerous players. Many footballers were left traumatized from the attack, and after the Federation opted to withdraw, it meant a nightmarish end to Togo's best era. And signs for the near future don't look that great for the Sparrowhawks, because they haven't qualified for the last three AFCONs. Believe it or not, Sudan used to be one of the most successful teams in Africa back in the day. With players like all-time leading scorer, Nasser El Din Abbas, the Sudanese won the African Cup of Nations in 1970, but since then it's only been downhill for the national team. Due to the retirement of stars, civil wars plaguing the nation, and numerous political conflicts causing a depletion in football resources, Sudan has fallen far from the heights it once knew. South Sudan gained independence in 2011, and their federation joined CAF in 2012. So once again, it shouldn't come to any surprise that they have never qualified for a major tournament. In Group C, we have Nigeria, South Africa, Benin, Zimbabwe, Rwanda, and Lesotho. After failing to qualify in their first six attempts between 1970 and 1990, the Nigerians have qualified for six of eight tournaments. Their best finish was in 1994, when the Super Eagles won a group consisting of a strong Bulgarian side and Maradona's Argentina. Nigeria then played Italy in the last 16 and were eliminated by a goal in extra time. In recent years, Nigeria has conjured up some of the most talented attacking players in the country, in the continent, hell even the world. And yet somehow every coach in recent time has produced the football equivalent that of a boiled unseasoned chicken. Oh my god, there he is, look at this twat, look at this prat, they do it on purpose. Before we talk about South African football, I just want to show you guys this new badge they have. It's literally straight out of Football Manager. When you think about South Africa, you probably think of 2010, you know, Shabalala. You know, this. But I'm not even sure people are aware of the fact that South Africa have actually qualified for two other World Cups. 2002 in particular saw the South Africans just miss out on the knockouts due to a goal scored tiebreaker. Going forward now, the national team has a decent core with an exciting attacking talent in Lyle Foster. Hopefully this time, Bafana Bafana doesn't get f***ed over by Ghana again. Benin's closest shot at qualifying for the World Cup was back in 2010 when they finished three points behind Ghana. After that, Benin has qualified for only one major tournament, 2019 AFCON. In that tournament though, they reached the knockouts and then stunned Morocco in the last 16. Eventually, the Cheetahs lost to Senegal in the quarters, but it was a great performance nonetheless. Too bad they never carried that success onward. But maybe there's hope in the shape of 18-year-old Halid Jankpata. He's a forward currently in Everton's youth academy. Zimbabwe, the country that has blessed us with names like Naoj Musona, Agent Sawu, and Marvelous Nakamba. Marvelous. <laughs> also, Zimbabwe has everyone's favorite African club, Chicken in FC. The closest Zimbabwe came to qualifying for a World Cup was back in 1994 when they were heartbroken by Cameroon who beat them on the final day. In recent years, however, the national team has been suspended twice. Once in 2016 due to unpaid debts which barred them from 2018 World Cup qualification, and more recently in 2022 due to government interference within the federation. I never really take this violation seriously because FIFA just kind of picks and chooses with this one. The team, however, was banned for the 2023 AFCON qualifiers, but they are still in the 2020 26 World Cup qualifier somehow. On a more positive note, 20-year-old Michael Ndiweni just made his debut for Newcastle. He was born in England, but is of Zimbabwean descent. Rwanda has never qualified for the World Cup, but they did make one appearance in the 2004 AFCON. One player you should look out for is 18-year-old Hakim Sahabo. The midfielder is currently playing for Standard Liège's reserve team and has already made four caps for his country. Lesotho has never qualified for a major tournament since its beginnings in 1970. Honestly, there's not really much to say about the national team, so again, I did a little bit of digging. My Findings? Lesotho Correctional Services FC. That's right. Prison FC. What's even funnier is the fact that this club has won six Lesotho Premier League titles. But if you dig a little deeper, you'll come across... 
Arsenal FC. Group D has Cameroon, Cape Verde, Angola, Libya, Eswatini, and Mauritius. Cameroon is considered one of the most successful nations in African football. They've qualified for eight World Cups and their best finish came in 1990. First, the indomitable Lions defeated reigning champions Argentina and then took down Romania's golden generation to win the group. In the knockouts, Roger Miller's two goals against Colombia sent the Cameroonians to the quarterfinals. The mid-2000s were another great time for Cameroon. This was like the Samuel Eto'o era. Now though, Cameroon is a shadow of its former self, but they did just recently beat Brazil in the World Cup. That was their first win in the World Cup since 2002. The list of footballers who could have played for Cape Verde is pretty interesting. You start with Nani, but then you have Patrick Vieira and Henrik Larsson to name a few. Instead though, the Blue Sharks have never qualified for the World Cup. The joint all-time leading scorer, Ryan Mendes, still actively plays though. With 15 goals and 69 caps, he hopes to be the difference maker. Angola in the mid-2000s were experiencing a bit of a golden generation, and as a result, they qualified for the 2006 World Cup. Unfortunately, once the generation dried up in the 2010s, Angola has continued to slide down the world rankings. After five straight AFCON qualifications, the national team has only made two appearances since 2015. Libya has always been at a disadvantage advantage compared to its North African counterparts due to constant political conflicts happening in the country. Most notably, there was the Libyan Civil War in 2014, which resulted in the halting of their domestic league. So with that, there's really no reason to talk about their World Cup qualification record. However, their AFCON record is super interesting. They've only qualified for three tournaments, 2012, 2006, and most notably 1982 when they finished runners-up. Eswatini is a bit better, they've been attempting to qualify for the World Cup since 1994 and have a couple wins. 2018 in particular, saw Eswatini take down Djibouti 8-1 on aggregate, but then they were eliminated by Nigeria. Over on the islands of Mauritius, the Dodos have made 8 attempts to qualify for the World Cup and have only ever won once. To be honest, that's uh, that's about it for the Dodo Islands. In Group B, you have Morocco, Zambia, Congo, Tanzania, Niger, and Eritrea. World Cup 2022 gave us some incredible stories, and Morocco's Cinderella run was easily the best of the best. In a group with Belgium and Croatia, Morocco conquered and finished top. In the last 16, the Moroccans defeated the passing merchants on penalties. Then in the quarters, a towering and Nasiri header sent Morocco to the semis. It became the first African country to reach this stage of the World Cup. While the dream was rudely awoken by France and Croatia, the Moroccans proudly finished fourth. Zambia hasn't had much success in World Cup qualifiers. However, just 11 years ago, the Zambians produced one of the greatest upsets in African football. In the final of the 2012 AFCON, Zambia defeated Didier Drogba's Ivory Coast on penalties. The genius behind the feat was, of course, African football's own Ev Renard, who dedicated the championship to the victims of the infamous plane crash of 1993 that took the lives of 30 people, including 18 players. However, since then, Zambia has been struggling to even qualify for the AFCON, let alone the World Cup. And with their performances in World Cup qualifiers getting worse over time, it's not really looking that great for the Zambians. The Republic of Congo back in 1997 had one more game to play against South Africa in World Cup qualifiers. Whoever came out on top of that match would be booking a ticket to the 1998 World Cup. In the end, though, an early South Africa African goal ended the hopes of Congo. Since then, Congo has struggled to replicate any of the magic of 1997, and they seem to only be getting worse. 2022 qualifiers was probably the worst example of it, as they went winless throughout the entire campaign. Tanzania also known as African Wisconsin. Tanzania not only haven't qualified for the World Cup, but until 2019, the Taifa Stars hadn't qualified for a major tournament since 1980. Things do slightly seem to be going in the right direction, as Tanzania also qualified for the recent AFCON. By the way, Tanzania will be one of the three nations to host the AFCON in 2027. Niger has never qualified for the World Cup, never even come close. In fact, there's been times where financial troubles have caused the national team to withdraw from qualification. The team has made AFCON appearances, however, back in 2012 and 2013, where they finished second to last in both tournaments. Eritrea's federation decided to withdraw from qualifiers out of fear that its players would escape from the country which is currently headed by a totalitarian dictator. The Eritrean government subjects its people to forced labor and conscription while limiting any freedom of speech or religion. Group F, Ivory Coast, Gabon, Kenya, Gambia, Burundi, and the Seychelles. Gervinho, Solomon Kalou, Yaya Toure, Didier Drogba, Seydou Dumbia if you want to really throw him in there. The Mid 2000s to mid 2010s were a gift for our eyes. Between this period, Ivory Coast qualified for three straight World Cups. Although they never made it past the group phase, they always at least got one win in each tournament. However, after a 2015 AFCON title, the stars of the national team faded into retirement. No one has been able to pick up their slack, and as a result, Ivory Coast has failed to qualify for the last two World Cups. When you think of Gabon, you think of one player, Pierre Emerick Aubameyang. If you're that one hipster that says Mario Lamina, shut the f up.
up. When it comes to World Cup qualifiers, Gabon just doesn't have that extra gear to give them the advantage against the Giants of Africa. However, in the last Alcon in 2021, Gabon reached the last 16, so maybe hope isn't all lost. Only 95% of it. Remember that time when Roman Molina reported the fact that the Kenyan FA had 16 different bank accounts? Well, I do. While that may be a bit overblown, it does kind of give you an idea of how shambolic the Federation is. Back in 2004, the Federation was suspended by FIFA. Then last year in February, the Kenyan FA was suspended for alleged misappropriation of funds. And then earlier this year, the Federation suspended 16 footballers and coaches due to match-fixing allegations. This has resulted in the national team struggling for any kind of success. Kenya has never qualified for a World Cup, and their last AFCON appearance was back in 2019. They will be hosting the AFCON in 2027 with two other countries, though. That aside though, the country holds my personal favorite football club in the continent. Kakamega Homeboys. Gambia has never qualified for the World Cup and has only ever made one appearance in the AFCON. That was in 2021, where they surprised many by reaching the quarterfinals. Forwards Musa Baro and Abli Jalo were crucial to that run and will be crucial once again if Gambia want to punch a ticket to North America. But Run D back in the 1998 World Cup qualifiers should have been in the final round after beating Sierra Leone on aggregate. However, they withdrew not too soon after due to the civil war occurring in the country. Burundi has only made one appearance in the AFCON and that was back in 2019. The national team lost all its games, conceded four goals, and scored none. The Seychelles may have a really cool looking flag and a relaxing song named after them by Masayoshi Takanaka. But when it comes to football, th there's nothing. No appearances in the AFCON and not a single win in seven attempts at World Cup qualification. Currently, the nation is ranked 199th in the world and not too long ago, they were actually at an all-time low 202nd in the world. Group G, Algeria, Guinea, Uganda, Mozambique, Botswana, and Somalia. Algeria has qualified for four World Cups. 1982 was the first ever World Cup they qualified for, and in their opener, they produced one of the greatest upsets in the tournament's history by beating reigning champions West Germany. Algeria also beat Chile, but unfortunately, they were f***ed over by a match-fixing scandal. 32 years later, in 2014, the Algerians advanced out of their group for the first time ever. However, the Algerians have not qualified ever since, and this was despite Algeria going on a 35-game unbeaten streak between 2019 and 2022. Guinea has never been good enough to qualify for the World Cup, but they have a pretty decent record in the AFCON. In 2004 and 2008, the national team finished in the quarterfinals. This resulted in them being as high as 22nd in FIFA rankings. Guinea's current squad is filled with players putting in some good performances in their respective leagues. The likes of Serho Girasi, Isiaga Sila. You could also throw in star player Nabi Keita, if he can stay healthy for more than three seconds, that is. Uganda during the early days of AFCON football were pretty decent. In the 1962 AFCON, they finished fourth, and in the 1978 edition, they finished runners-up. Fast forward to now, though, the Ugandans have haven't qualified for the last two AFCONs. But hey, at least they're guaranteed for 2027 as they host the AFCON with two other nations. Bet you don't know what the other two nations are. Uganda has no World Cups under their belts, and their current head coach is Paul Putt, a man very familiar with African football as he's managed Gambia, Burkina Faso, Kenya, Guinea, and Congo in the last 15 years. Oh yeah, also, there was that one time Uganda's domestic league went viral after they rewarded a player bread and yogurt as a Man of the Match award. Mozambique has one of the hardest looking flags in the world, but that hasn't helped them at all when it comes to World Cup qualification. The national team has qualified for a few Afghans, however, they've never been able to escape the groups. Botswana, the country whose flag is being used by a lot of Man City fans on Twitter. Botswana has never qualified for the World Cup, but they do have one appearance in the AFCON. That was back in 2012 where they lost every game, but they did have a lead against Mali for six whole minutes. When I think of Somalian football, I think of the memes about how Somalis just uh, don't pass the ball. While the Somali national team has never made it past the first round of qualifiers, there's a lot more to them, because there's a pretty massive Somali diaspora. One player that comes to many Somali minds is Taha Abdi Ali, a Swedish-born Somali. Just this year, he scored six goals and assisted seven from Malma. Easily, he's the most talented Somali, but he's not made a single cap for the country. Somalis, let me know if he's actually even interested in playing for the country, because I, I couldn't find anything there. Group H, we have Tunisia, Equatorial Guinea, Namibia, Malawi, Liberia, and Sao Tome and Principe. Tunisia has qualified for five World Cups and has never made it to the knockouts. In World Cup 2022, it felt like Tunisia's best chance to make the last 16, but their campaign never recovered after a shocking loss to Australia. The national team still holds the main core, but but it is getting older. So sure, will Tunisia qualify out of a relatively easy group? Yeah. How far will they go from there? 
not far. Equatorial Guinea has never qualified for a World Cup. However, with how small the landmass is, they have a pretty impressive record in the AFCON. They may only appear sporadically, but in all three appearances, they have reached the quarterfinals or farther. Equatorial's qualification campaign for World Cup 2022 was a huge step as well. Equatorial Guinea went from just collecting one win from each qualification campaign to winning four, drawing three, and losing just once. Namibia has no World Cup showings, but they did make three in the AFCON. They also just recently qualified for the 2023 AFCON. Now going a little bit deeper, in the Namibian Premier League, there's a lot of very interesting club names. This includes Civics FC, Life Fighters FC, Mighty Gunners FC, UNAM FC, University of Namibia, and Young Brazilians FC. Quite like Namibia, Malawi has made it to three AFCON tournaments. 2023 was the most memorable when Malawi managed to reach the last 16, and in the knockouts, they held a lead against favorites Morocco until the end of halftime. Malawi's all-time leading scorer is Kina Firi, who bagged 71 goals in 117 caps between 1973 and 1981. Liberia found themselves just one point away from qualifying for the 2002 World Cup. However, they've not been able to come anywhere close ever since. Liberia's all-time leading scorer is the legendary George Wea, one of the most decorated African footballers of all time. He was also once president of Liberia, and in 2020, he made this banger of a song. Also, how fitting for some Liberian footballers to be playing in both the US and Malaysia. Sao Tome and Principe has never qualified for a single major tournament. It probably hasn't helped them that the national team has gone on numerous hiatuses like their Michael Reeves. As Sao Tome and Principe's squad is filled with a bunch of players of Portuguese descent, a lot of them play in the lower leagues in Portugal. One footballer in particular plays for a club called Oriental Dragon, a club that had the goal of signing Chinese players to improve the Chinese national team. Finally, we have Group I. We we've gone over like 70 teams man. But in Group I, we have Mali, Ghana, Madagascar, Central African Republic, Comoros, and Chad. A single comedic goal in the playoffs was what kept Mali from qualifying for the World Cup last year. As a result, the Malians will be on a revenge tour with their insane lineup of talented midfielders. Players like Yves Bissouma, Mohamed Kamara, and Cheikh Dukore. Since 2006, Ghana has only missed one World Cup out of the last five. They should have missed last year's tournament, but they lost a contest for who could play more uninspiring football against Nigeria. Oh, and also the officiating may have helped them in the previous round. Anyways, Ghana's best performance, of course, you all know this, was back in World Cup 2010. They reached the quarterfinals and could have become the first African semi-finalist had it not been for Luis Suarez's hands. This is a relatively easy group for Ghana, but you could just never tell these days with this team. Madagascar has only ever qualified for one tournament, the 2019 AFCON, and that one was super special for them, because Madagascar managed to shock everyone by winning a group consisting of Guinea and Nigeria. They then went on to defeat DR Congo to reach the quarterfinals. Madagascar have a good amount of footballers playing in France and Belgium, most notably Loic Lapoussin of Union saint gilles The Central African Republic has never qualified for a single major tournament. They came close to qualifying for the 2023 AFCON, but bottled it in their last two games. One player you might recognize from the national team is Jeffrey Kondogbia. He played five times for France before switching in 2018. The Comoros qualified for their first AFCON in 2021 and surprised many by escaping a group consisting of Morocco, Gabon, and Ghana. When it comes to World Cup qualification, however, the team has never won in four campaigns. Things though could change however with the 2026 World Cup qualifiers. Having already shown they can beat opponents like Ghana, who are in their group, there's a pretty good chance for them here. And finally, we have the country with the funny meme name. Chad. Chad, though, has never lived up to its meme name as they've never qualified for any major tournament. To make things worse, they've had to withdraw from multiple qualification campaigns due to financial issues or FIFA suspensions. Egypt has gone off to a perfect starting group A. They defeated both Djibouti and Sierra Leone to earn 6-6 six six points for the window. Oh yeah, in the Sierra Leone match, there was a bunch of fans that tried to attack Egyptian players. Totally normal stuff. Meanwhile, a battle for second has already appeared between Burkina Faso and Guinea-Bissau. The two nations played each other to open their campaigns, but nothing could separate them. In Group B, Senegal and Sudan are tied on points, with Senegal having the advantage on goal difference. Senegal put four past South Sudan, but then could only grab a point from Togo away from home. Sudan also couldn't get more than a point from Togo, and then won at home versus DR Congo. Group C is giving us some early shockers. To be honest, I'm not really that shocked. Nigeria, who are favorites to qualify out of this group, have been severely underwhelming. 
even more severely underwhelming than I thought they could be, because they drew against both Lesotho and Zimbabwe. In contrast to Nigeria, Lesotho don't have a single footballer playing in Europe. But enough about the football equivalents of divorced white motherfa. Currently, Rwanda hold the top spot, and this is no fluke as they defeated South Africa 2-0 at home. Speaking of which, South Africa are in second, just one point away from the Rwandans. In Group D, three nations find themselves tied on points. Cameroon are first thanks to goal difference. They started their campaign with a 3-0 win against Mauritius, but were only able to earn a draw versus Libya. Second place Cape Verde started their campaign with a draw, but then ended the November window with a 2-0 away win versus Eswatini. Finally, Libya, before their draw with Cameroon, earned a slim win versus Eswatini. Despite Morocco only playing one game in November, they still lead Group E. Tied on points with them are three other teams. Zambia earned three points off Congo, while Niger earned three points off Zambia, and Tanzania earned three points off Niger. Group F saw two nations have perfect starts so far. Current group leaders Ivory Coast defeated Seychelles 9-0 and then ended the window with a 2-0 win for Gambia. Meanwhile, second place Gabon started their campaign with two consecutive 2-1 wins. Over in Group G, everyone has points besides Somalia. Algeria currently lead as you'd expect thanks to wins against Somalia and Mozambique, while everyone else currently holds three points to their name. Group H is seeing a close battle between Tunisia and Equatorial Guinea, who both earned 6-6 points in November. Tunisia defeated Sao Tome and Principe, and then later Malawi, while Equatorial Guinea started with a victory against Namibia and then followed that up with a win in Liberia. Group I is seeing something truly special. The f***ing Comoros are top of the group. And lo and behold, they did it by beating up on Ghana again. It's my show now, baby! Down in second place is Mali, who have four points to their name. They defeated Chad, but conceded an equalizer at home against the Central African Republic. Trailing just behind is Madagascar and Ghana with three points respectively. Finally, I'm, I'm done with all of it. The preview and the review, the done. I don't know how long this video is going to be, but I feel like it's going to be very, very long. Both three continents now having qualifiers. How are your teams doing? Is your country doing well? Are they doing poorly? Do you want to die? Of course, though, a massive shout out to all our patrons, including Janusz Balash, Miliway009, Adazir Makalankam, Aldipu, Alex Rod, Ulta, Anaya20, Aresan, Billy Jack, Daniel Ortiz, Francisco Hernandez, Hysteria, Marco Fujimoto, Miguel Munoz, Return Fire, Rory Burns, Slider Kit, Snifrix, Sakuoka Fan, Tana Permilia, Celine Khan, Tamakis, Victor, A1KLCF, Chris Visconti, Dominic Griffin, Louis, Joe Paricio, Kyler Krebs, Lucian von Kreuz, Michael Nista, Nish, Patrick Barley, Raspberry Ale, Rowan Cookie, Sylvia. Citrus, subscribe to Tim Tim, Unbroken Persona, and Valencia14. If you'd like to join the Patreon, there'll be a link down below and an annotation up there. Wow, that's incredible. You can follow my Twitter if you want, follow my Instagram if you like. I've been posting stuff on there, you know, it, they're pretty pretty cool photos, you know, you, you, you can like them if you want. You can also follow my TikTok if you want, uh, or you could follow my semi-active Twitch instead. But until then, I'll see you guys.